Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Nirav Patel, and uh, I am a partner at Bateswells. Bateswells is a law firm based in London, uh, and we were the first law firm uh, to become a B Corp uh, in the UK, showing our commitment to uh, operating as a purpose-driven business. Um, so I'd like to just set the scene very quickly about why I'm here, what I'd like to talk about. Uh, Bateswells, as a firm, does a lot of work outside of just being lawyers. Um, we're really trying to drive change. And as part of that, we've been working with Equality Impact Investing on a project around equalizing deal terms. This is an ongoing project that has been led by my colleague Sung Hae Park, and its findings will uh, be publicly released in due course. We've also hosted some roundtable discussions around ESG with ESG investors and impact investors. And so I thought it would be useful to use this session to run through some of the outcomes of that research project and those roundtable discussions. So this is quite a bold heading, is ESG tarnished? And I've sat in on some very interesting discussions today around ESG, uh, around reporting obligations. Um, I'm going to start just by very quickly considering what ESG investing is, and apologies in advance if this is very familiar territory to some of you, but I think it's important to sometimes just recheck and balance where we've, where we've come from. The OECD report on ESG investing practices, progress and challenges provides that broadly speaking, ESG investing is an approach that seeks to incorporate environmental, social, and governance factors into asset allocation and risk decisions so as to generate sustainable, long-term financial returns. ESG, as I think we all probably know, has grown at a phenomenal rate. According to the GSIA, the Global Sustainability Investment Alliance, in 2020, approximately $35 trillion in assets were being managed in accordance with ESG principles across five major markets, Australia and New Zealand, Canada, Europe, Japan, and the United States, equating to a third of all professionally managed assets across those regions. And the reasons for ESG, uh, the growth in ESG investing include growing social attention, We've all seen trial by social media in recent years. And this has been around climate change, biodiversity de degradation, responsible business conduct, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And another reason for this ESG investing growth has been a growing momentum for corporations and financial institutions to move away from short-term perspectives of risks and returns and focus more on long-term sustainable investment performance. Sounds good, right? But interestingly, there was a strong view coming out of our research and our projects that felt that the ESG concept and term had become very tarnished. And some of the fingers were being pointed at the additional regulations that have been brought into public company requirements around reporting, and the feeling that this has generated a tick box type approach and exercise, which was something mentioned on an earlier panel discussion. According to a Bloomberg story in December 2021, ESG ratings don't measure a company's impact on earth and society, and in fact, they gauge the opposite the potential impact of the world on the company and its shareholders. And some digging by the Harvard Business Review in August 2022 found that an ESG investment statement from the asset manager State Street defined ESG issues as events or conditions that should they occur could cause a negative impact on the value of an investment. Value not ESG. The Harvard Business Review went on to talk about how marketeers are taking advantage of the confusion and doublespeak around ESG when looking for investors with an overuse of terms such as sustainability and circular economy with no clear metrics or criteria about how they propose to achieve those objectives or promote those goals. 
And there are really no universal ESG ratings or rankings. It's very hard to do. And don't get me wrong, we are all aware that there are many, many institutions out there who are trying to create some standardization. But it, your average impact investor would argue, how can you measure ESG when ESG is so subjective? Whereas gender equality might be the most important UN sustainable development goal for some people, it may not be relevant or as important for those who are trying to achieve the goal of clean water and sanitization. So what can investors do? And this is something that we've really tested people on and asked and inquired about because there seems to be a mismatch between investor expectations and investee expectations. One of the big themes that came out was that investee companies felt that the beginning of discussions with the investors were very collaborative. But when then things somehow got lost in translation when they received, for example, a due diligence request with loads of questions about things that probably weren't relevant, or they received first draft legal documents, which were full of all the belt and braces language that you wouldn't need for a purposeful type investment and would be more appropriate for a profit-driven, non-ESG focused business investment. So we considered how can investors work better with investee companies around ESG. One of the things we found was that collaboration and realism is really key. Um, there was a feeling that there's no point in setting ESG targets and metrics which are generic or unrealistic. And there was a real feeling that a lot of investors were simply passing the buck down when it came to ESG, particularly the larger investors who themselves might have been subject to ESG requirements. And there was a slightly uncomfortable suspicion that those investors themselves didn't understand the ESG metrics and they were simply kicking it down the road to the target companies and leaving it to them to resolve and figure out. And of course, as you might imagine, this is not helpful or productive. So there are some things that investors can do to help provide target companies more support in achieving those ESG goals and requirements. For example, they could share ESG monitoring software, methods or other know-how, including training on how they work and how they can be implemented. They can provide practical feedback on where ESG targets haven't been met and what a company can do to actually achieve them in measurable and meaningful ways going forward. And as I mentioned before, and I'll mention again, they'll really work towards carefully crafting realistic and bespoke ESG metrics and targets. So for a business that might be completely green to ESG, uh, it might be appropriate to simply start with a requirement that they measure their carbon footprint, get rid of their single-use plastic cups, move to a paper light or paper-free model, and over time implement and increase slightly more challenging ESG metrics, but in a way that they can realistically achieve them without diverting the entire focus of the business just onto doing that. In this way, there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from impact investors. As a firm, we do a lot of work with impact investors, advising them on investments that they make, uh, particularly in the global south. And those impact funds have been around for decades. Uh, we're talking about those who were initially sort of government-backed funds, particularly set up in jurisdictions which had Commonwealth interests around the world. So the UK is a very good example. The UK, of course, had a, a large global Commonwealth at one point uh, and set up effectively what were then regarded as emerging markets investments to help prop up those economies and get them into a form where they can have their own infrastructure and rely on their own growth. But really, at the essence of them, uh, and what evolved from them was an ESG type approach and concept and understanding that the ESG element of those investments was just as critical as anything involving some kind of financial return. Uh, and they are very well versed on ESG as a result. They have dedicated teams who work in this area 
and work with Investee target companies to achieve those goals, including some of the things I was mentioning earlier, helping them set up modeling, measuring, reporting, and equipment and software in order to do that in a manner that's easy for them to follow, and that also meets the required metrics that are being imposed by the ESG investor. They also put in place things like ESAPs, environmental and social action plans, and again, they'll navigate the investment company through how to achieve those goals. Another thing that's worth mentioning when it comes to investing in ESG-driven businesses, and this was also mentioned, I heard, on the previous panel discussion, is that people often drop the S and the G element of ESG. The E is very snazzy. It gets the most media attention. Environmental matters are always all over the newspapers. It's tangible, it's measurable, and it's very popular, therefore, in the media. But businesses in this space, purposeful businesses, ESG-driven businesses, really understand the importance and pride themselves on also driving forward the S, the social, and the G, the governance elements of the way they operate their business. So for example, with the S, the social, they'll adopt fair employment practices to drive improved diversity and inclusivity. And the G for governance, they'll adopt policies around anti-bribery, anti-corruption, and in other methods of good practice, such as protection for whistleblowers, which is particularly relevant in the current days. So with all of this background, I thought it would be good to talk about B Corps. B Corps provide a very good example of businesses who are committed to focusing on ESG. And there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from people who've purchased or invested in B Corps over the years, and the considerations they should take into account uh, when making those acquisition decisions and investment decisions, and how they resonate across any other type of business which has an ESG or purpose-led model. For those who are unfamiliar with B Corps, B Lab, the non-profit behind B Corps, describes certified B Corporations as businesses that meet the highest standards of verified social and environmental performance, public transparency, and legal accountability to balance profit and purpose. There are over 7,000 B Corps in over 150 countries in just, uh, sorry, 150 industries in just under 100 countries around the world, of which 1, 000, over 1,500 B Corps are based just here in the UK. So it's a, a very growing accreditation and mark that has been more globally recognized. And I'm sure you would have noticed the massive B Corp logo on the building as you came in as well earlier today. So what lessons can we learn from investing in ESG-focused businesses such as B Corps? Well, the first one is emphasizing, as an investor, your understanding and commitment to the triple bottom line. And the triple bottom line is very much a B Corp concept, but is also recognized in most ESG businesses, and that is focusing on profit, people, and planet. Directors of B Corps are obliged to advance these triple bottom line objectives. It's written into the constitutional documents of the B Corp company. So in, in the UK, that's the Articles of Association for the company. And so they can't make decisions which divert or diverge from that triple bottom line. And investors who genuinely want to drive forward the purpose of the business should make clear to the board, to the shareholders, that they want to maintain the B Corp status and are committed to the wider values of the, and the ethos of the business. Investors and acquirers should also understand the board's mandate. So in a normal acquisition or an investment into a company which is not ESG driven, so a for-profit business, you know, your, your traditional businesses, shall we say, it would be quite normal to expect that the directors would also have regard to the interests of the shareholders when they're making decisions about the future of the company. This is not the case for B Corps. B Corps, the directors of B Corps are obliged to prioritize uh, the purpose of the business and this triple bottom line before perhaps 
advancing the interests of the shareholders. And this is something that investors must accept before going into an investment process. And lastly, investors really ought to know what the company's and the director's duties are. And I've talked before about uh, the director's obligations to the triple bottom line. But they also, like any directors under UK company law, are obliged to, have, to meet certain standards, requirements and duties. But on top of that, they have the important considerations for B Corps to take into account to seek to have a material positive impact on society and the environment as a whole. This means the positive impact of the company should be meaningful and implemented through its core business and operations, not just through ancillary activities such as a limited CSR program. So there are lessons we can learn from investments into B Corps and from impact investors. The key outcomes of our research is that communication is key and ESG targets should be realistic in order to be meaningful for both the investor and the target company. So that just about wraps up everything I wanted to cover. I think we may have a few minutes for a couple of questions. Thank you. I have a mic. Fantastic. <laughs> You've timed that perfectly. Thank you. Uh, yep, we have time for probably one question on the end. I saw a hand appear at the front. Uh, Chai, if we just get a mic down here, just in the uh, grey shirt at the front. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, you mentioned about the risk of uh, ESG becoming a tick box exercise. I want to get your views on how um, can B Corp not become another tick box exercise and people change because they really want to change versus just getting that B Corp certification. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. And I think B Labs have sort of spent a lot of time considering this, exactly this issue. It, it is. Um, you know, we're, we're a B Corp, as I mentioned. It is a heavy process to, to go through and re achieve that accreditation. And a lot of it is not just about achieving certain metrics and targets. It's, I think they want to understand that you have a genuine interest in trying to do some good outside of your day job, you know, outside of, in our case, just being a law firm. Um, so, and it, and it invites you into a whole community, which, you know, it's kind of like basically everyone who's come here today. You, you are part of a community who are clearly interested in driving forward a positive, wider, purposeful agenda beyond just making profit for yourself. So I think, in, personally, I think it's fairly safe that that won't become the case for, for B Corps. OK, thank you very much indeed. And that brings us to time on that. So Narav Patel, thank you ever so much. Really enjoyed your company. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.